So, Mr. Secretary, I think we should be beginning with uh, what I would say icebreaking question. That is about our first meeting, which happened at Al Farfa dinner, which was in June 2017. And then it feels like such a long time ago. And then at the time, you just ha had begun to work as a director for the CIA. And a little more than a year later, then you were appointed as uh, so the 70th Secretary of State of the United States. So, so far, I think you were the first and the only American who served in those two positions. So my first icebreaking question would be this, which is, well, did your experience of working as CIA director, did it help you to perform your duty as Secretary of State? If so, how? Yes, it did. Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. It's great to be with you. Uh, it was, in fact, very important uh, for me to have had the opportunity to be the CIA director for about 18 months before I became Secretary of State. There are many reasons. Uh, one, it, it gave me some familiarity with a set of issues and a depth on some issues that I, I didn't have before that when I was serving in Congress. So it was a chance to quickly come to understand challenges in the world, uh, different interactions, and to get a sense of who the various uh, players were, the various leaders in those countries. But second, uh, the president, President Trump, wanted me to be his briefer. So almost, almost every day when I was in Washington, I gave him his daily intelligence update. And that permitted me to get to understand how uh, my president, how America's president processed information, how he took on board data. Uh, it gave me a sense of his decision-making process. And that proved to develop a relationship between he and I that was incredibly valuable to me in my two and a half years as Secretary of State. At the same time, I think now we can move on to a little more, say, uh, substantive issues. And uh, on November 8th, you had midterm election. But at the same time, uh, the margin of victory of Republican Party, it was not as large as it had been expected. So I think it is for that reason that some people are saying, well, we were expecting red wave, but it stopped at creating red ripple. So if you agree with that, uh, say, analysis, then what could be the reason why big red wave was not created? So I, I think what you say is in part true. Uh, I was optimistic that we would do a little bit better. My party, the Republican Party, the Conservative Party, would do a little bit better than it did. But we did pretty good. Uh, look, there's still some races that haven't been called, and that, that will prove important. And importantly, and, and this doesn't get uh, uh, observed around the world as much, but we were very successful at the other set of races thinking about our state governors who are incredibly important political actors. Right. Well, well as a matter of fact, midterm election, of course, it was an election in the United States. But United States being the United States, I think it will have repercussion on various different parts of the world. And then uh, I wish to go to some of those places. And then let me start with Ukraine. And with respect to Ukraine, then Ukrainians, I think, impressed us with how valiantly and how effectively it is fighting against the second largest, largest army in the whole world. But even then, I think they depend a lot upon the United States for the materials, for the training, for the intelligence, etc., etc. So against such a background, then there is a gentleman, Kevin McCarthy, and then, uh, well, again, it is often said that he's going to be uh, the elected as Speaker of the House, and Mr. McCarthy, I think he has been saying for some time now that if Republicans come back to power, then I will stop writing blank check for the Ukrainians. So my question for you, Mr. Secretary, would be this, which is that what is the meaning of that, stopping writing blank check? Yes. Uh, I, I don't think this midterm election will change America's commitment to supporting the Ukrainian in their fight against the Russians one bit. I think that the resources we've provided to date amount to 19 or $20 billion worth of resources. I'm convinced we will continue to provide those. The Ukrainians have, as you said, uh, proven to be incredibly effective. Kevin McCarthy's comment, I know Kevin pretty well. Uh, I think what he meant uh, by that was 
It is also important that as we deliver weapon systems that we ensure that they are the right systems, that they get into the right hands, that they don't go to corrupt for corrupt purposes. So what I, I, I think he meant by not writing a blank check is we have to make sure that as we provide assistance to the Ukrainians that we do it well. And then I think there is one issue which enjoys truly bipartisan support in the Congress today. That will be, uh, well, in a sense, both Republicans and Democrats, they in fact have up, up one view that in fact you should be effectively resisting all these, uh, all these say, expansionist moves coming from China. So that in fact is one issue which is enjoying truly bipartisan support. But at the same time, my observation has been Republicans seems to be thinking of certain additional ways through which they could be, well, even strengthening this pressure upon the Chinese. So between Washington and, uh, and Beijing, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be the case that this collision course, we often t talk about United States and China being on the collision course, wouldn't it be the case it could be accelerated? So my sense is a, a bit different from that. Your, your point is well taken. Chinese Communist Party presents the greatest threat to the Western world, to Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, uh, certainly to Taiwan, of, of any threat that is out there. So there, you're right, there is, there's, no, there's no difference between the two parties. But there is a difference in the tools that we believe are important to confront it. I, I believe uh, that the first thing we need to do is make sure we confront it here at home in the United States. Every country needs to do this. They're working inside our colleges and universities. They're working inside our schools. They're conducting spying operations, just as they are in 70 or 80 countries around the world. And the whole world needs to push them back from inside the gates. Uh, then the challenge remains of Chinese expansion. When you talk about a confrontation, uh, it is my firm belief that the Chinese Communist Party has been at war with the West for 40 years. So this is not a confrontation that the United States is bringing. This is a confrontation that Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, and it's not China versus the U.S., it is the idea of China versus sovereign nations who are just trying to live their own lives. China wants to disrupt that. It wants every nation to be a vassal state to it. They, they want it to pay a tribute and homage to them. I mean, Xi Jinping openly speaks of this. He talks about small countries as, I'm just sorry, you're a small country. Uh, this is indecent, it is immoral, it is not the thing that any free country should tolerate. And so we collectively, all of us, uh, nations throughout the Indo-Pacific, uh, Arab nations, nations in Europe, we are all gonna have to confront this challenge that Xi Jinping presents. And I hope that my party, and indeed my country will lead that effort. Right, well, uh... Well, uh, when you say that it is not just between the United States and China, but at the same time China, uh, with respect to a large number of other countries as, as well, I totally agree with you. But at the same time, as a diplomat, as an ambassador, then uh, I, in fact, used to serve as an ambassador during the second term of President Obama and first year of President Trump. And I came to find there was a little bit of a difference in approach between Democrats and Republicans, especially President Trump in the sense that President Trump, in fact, didn't, didn't really think about the role which could be played by the Allies. So that, in fact, was the impression which was created at the time, in the sense that where, where so far as President Trump is concerned, it is, well, 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 more, say, dif more defense sharing, that, in fact, rather than anything else. So could it be one of the impacts of, uh, House being, 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 in a sense, taken by the Republicans again, which is that where priority in the relationship with allies, it could be, in a sense, being placed once again on, on greater burden sharing. Could it be the case? I suppose it could, but I, I actually, I, I don't see these as competing ideas. Uh, I, I supported uh, President Trump's effort to convince our allies and friends that they should bear their fair share of the burden. We, we were very clear. Uh, we, we, wanted to, we, were, we were doing the things that made America more secure. And it was absolutely essential that we have good partners, uh, good partners with South Korea, good partnerships with Japan. Uh, we wanted them to be better partners amongst each other as well. Uh, absent that, absent that partnership, 
it's, it's not possible for America to carry that burden. It's not a matter of money. It's not a, it's not a resource matter. Uh, it's a distance and time and skill set and cultural understandings. All of those things that come together to actually deliver security. Think trade relationships, think intelligence sharing, all of those things. This was, this was what President Trump and I were both working on. Secretary, thank you so much. In the last year, there was a G7 meeting in Cornwall in UK. And this year, there was NATO meeting in uh, Madrid, NATO summit meeting in Madrid. On both occasions, then uh, UK last year and NATO this year, they invited some countries from Asia Pacific, in the Pacific, to come and participate at G7 meetings as well as NATO summit meeting this year. So I said myself, in a sense, well, from U.S. perspective, across the Atlantic, you had NATO allies, and across the Pacific, you have, uh, well, those allies you just mentioned, Korea, Japan, Australia, and, and, and New Zealand. And I said to myself, these gestures coming from uh, G7 and from NATO, I thought they were helpful gestures when the rule-based international order, which has been built by the United States, it is being challenged in so many different parts of the world. I think it is a very helpful gesture to be made to countries in Asia Pacific. Would you agree with me? I completely agree. I was pleased to see that too. I was really pleased to see that these countries accepted these invitations and wanted to be part of that. I, I made an enormous effort to convince uh, the senior leadership at NATO, Secretary General Stoltenberg and the team around him, that while NATO, and it's, it's hard to go back before the invasion of Ukraine, but that NATO had a responsibility uh, in Europe, it's, uh, it's historic responsibility, but that NATO was being worked against by the Chinese Communist Party as well. Well, well as a matter of fact, I used to serve as Korea's ambassador to European Union, that was back in 2011, and even at the time, I had an opportunity to, to attend some of the NATO Council meetings because of something called ISAF, International Security Assistance Force. And then Korea was participating in that ISAF through something called PRT, Provincial Reconstruction Team, in, uh, in, in Parwan, in a, in, a, in a state called Parwan in Afghanistan, and then began to be engaging with NATO. And then that, in fact, culminated in uh, President Yoon of Korea this, this year to, in fact, announce at the NATO summit meeting in Madrid, that Korea, in fact, would be opening representative office to NATO. Korea is not a member of NATO, but at the same time, President Yoon announced that we'll be opening our representative office to NATO. And uh, Mr. Secretary, you have been to North Korea several times, and then you met with Chairman Kim as well. And the thing is, well, this year, beginning from last year and then this year, then things are getting even worse in the sense that this year alone, North Korea conducted more than 30 missile testers. And then many of them were short-range missiles, meaning, in fact, they are focusing upon short-range nuclear, nuclear missiles, which can be used for delivering tactical nuclear weapons. And then they are vowing, I mean, North Korea is vowing that it will develop tactical nuclear weapons. This year, beginning from this year, they are saying, well, it is for actual use in the warfare. If there is a military conflict, then, then we will use it early on, and then we will use it massively. And all of it is being received rather seriously by the Korean public. So large number, number of them are suggesting, well, we should be, in a sense, redeploying tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Some of them are even saying, we should be having our own nuclear program. And it is very alarming in the sense that, well, opinion poll, if you follow the opinion poll, it is 70% of Koreans who support the idea of Korean nuclear program. So I think it is necessary that we should be giving sufficient level of assurance to our citizens that, in fact, North Korea is behaving very badly, but at the same time, uh, with United States as our ally, there is no reason to be overly, re to, be re uh, to be overly reacting. That, I think, is what is important. But at the same time, I think I know that there are certain Republican leaders who are more positively, positively inclined to the redeployment of tactical, tactical nu nuclear weapons in Korea. 
So my question for you would be this, which is that when now, again, we are talking about uh, Republican Party or taking the House, could it raise the possibility of tactical nuclear weapons being deployed in South Korea? So we do have to remember that President Biden will still be firmly in control of America's foreign policy. Our, our legislative body has some role in this, but not a tremendous one. So I think what you saw from the Biden administration in their first two years with respect to policy relating to North Korea likely to continue. And I actually think that's not a good thing. To your point, uh, Chairman Kim now feels emboldened uh, launching t right more than two and a half dozen missile systems, uh, also building his conventional forces as well. You know, I, I did spend a lot of time with Chairman Kim. I spent a lot of time in North Korea and with uh, Kim Young Chol and with Chae Sun Wee, the senior North Korean uh, nuclear negotiators, and we failed. We didn't get the nuclear weapons out of their hands, but we 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 did deliver more certainty. There was less risk then than there is today. Uh, and I regret that President Biden hasn't been able to maintain that, so, that same level of certainty. And I can see why the people of South Korea uh, feel the way that they do, feel like they are more at risk. Uh, two, two thoughts. Uh, as for decisions about South Korea and its own program, that will be for the people of South Korea to make that decision, to evaluate. But I hope that they will do so in the context of a sound American partner that they can come to trust and rely will continue to deliver. And I hope they will also remember in this context that the North Korean missile system, their program, is largely there because the Chinese Communist Party permits it to be there. When, when we were negotiating with Chairman Kim, he would always go meet with Xi Jinping, both before and after our meetings. Uh, we often talk about China and North Korea as separate problem sets. But in fact, my experience teaches, I think, that they are in fact deeply connected. Were the Chinese Communist Party to be serious, the Chinese Communist Party to be serious about participating in the sanctions on the North Korean regime, I believe there is the possibility there could actually be a change in the behavior from Chairman Kim in North Korea. But the Chinese play footsie. They continue to provide resources and tools. They don't enforce the sanctions on energy, traveling in and out of Korea. That creates real risk in the region, and the Biden administration, along with the South Korean government, needs to make clear to the Chinese Communist Party that that continued work is unacceptable and begin to impose real cost on the Chinese Communist Party to get them to bring Chairman Kim to heel. Well, Mr. Secretary, you just mentioned, you just said that during President Trump's time, uh, even even uh, uh, with respect to uh, this North Korean nuclear threat, there was higher level of certainty at the time, which in fact uh, has been has been undermined uh, in in more recent years. So, could you elaborate by, uh, by what you mean by saying uh, higher level of certainty? What what did you mean by that? So there was an implicit understanding that Chairman Kim would not engage in nuclear testing. Um, we had convinced him for some of his more capable longer range missile systems that he ought not to conduct those tests, and he didn't. And indeed for all ranges, from, from conventional artillery to short range missiles, both uh, guided and unguided, both ballistic and free fall, uh, he, he conducted fewer tests uh, in exchange for uh, a, a little less resources being expended on joint exercises. There was an understanding that, that brought the temperature down. Chairman Kim also understood that we were serious about enforcing sanctions. We were pulling ships from the seas off of North Korea. We were stopping coal shipments. We were working diligently to prevent the North Koreans from having the money and resources to continue to hold South Korea and the region at risk. And over time, that would have continued to reap benefits in security and prosperity for the world and for the South Korean people. This administration has simply walked away from that and isn't remotely as serious about it as we were. And then what I hear, what I read, is that well, if there is one issue which, in fact, uh, affected the way Americans voted in the midterm election this year, this year, it was inflation. It was pocketbook issues. What is the meaning of that? I mean, what, 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 is, what, kind, what is the implication of that for the, the new Congress? I think maybe there, there is a likelihood that uh, I would call it, uh, say, economic nationalism. I think there is a higher chance for all those legislations 
I don't think you'll see big changes in terms of when you speak of economic nationalism, if you're thinking about uh, protectionist barriers, trade barriers, I don't think you'll see Congress be active at imposing increased levels of them. Uh, my sense is what this Congress will most likely seek to do uh, is to try and again open up the capacity for American energy to flow to our friends and partners. Uh, I hope that that's the case. We all want clean air, safe drinking water, uh, but American energy fueled the global economy for the last 10 years. We were the largest producer of crude oil and among the largest producers of natural gas, and we were a massive net exporter of those products around the world. And today we're not. That's just, that was a political decision that the Biden administration made. And the result of that is that the bad guys, uh, the, the guys who control product pricing around the world today, are no longer friends of the West. And we need to, we need to make America again the swing producer on those energy products. Well, Mr. Secretary, it was during my time as ambassador in Washington, D.C., that U.S. Congress was seriously looking into this, into this question about if United States should be exporting crude oil and gas to foreign countries. And at the time, we were getting much of it from the Middle East, from Southeast Asia, even from Russia. And I said, well, now, United States, it is thinking about exporting them. So we should be getting them, in a sense, and as, a, as a consumer of fossil fuel. Then, of course, if there are a larger number of suppliers, it will be to our benefit. So that's, that's the benefit we could, we could get uh, from that, that uh, say, aspect. But at the same time, it can be, be helpful for us to be reducing our trade deficit or trade surplus with the United States. So that was my recommendation back to Seoul. And that, in fact, is the reason why we began to import natural gas, liquefied natural gas, from Louisiana. But at the same time, I think there is uh, this issue about, about say, say uh, this uh, well, climate change. And when it comes to climate change, then I tend to believe that maybe we should be, in a sense, making virtue out of necessity in the sense that now Russians, they are cutting supply of oil, they are cutting supply of gas to, to Europe. And I think there could be added, say, in a sense, momentum, so far as Europeans are concerned, to be going in that direction. That is to say, to be further developing their re recyclable, recyclable energy, as well as their nuclear energy, so that they could be, it could be another win-win situation. Would you agree with me? Uh I don't know. Uh, in, in some answers, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. The the, um, the the climate change effort needs to be based on real science and real facts. It is not the case today that you have affordable alternatives to fossil fuels. Uh, it just doesn't. It doesn't exist today. And so I, I'm happy to hope that we can run the world on sunshine and windmills. Uh, but today, that's simply not possible to do affordably. You need all of the infrastructure that comes in behind that. And so we should work on that. But this isn't even just a matter of Western economies being successful. And uh, I, I hear people say, well, we should just stop it. Secretary Kerry, who's the climate envoy for the United States, says, oh, we should do this and we only have years. I, I, think, that's, I think that's fundamentally unscientific. And it is indecent to do to the poorest countries in the world, the poorest people in the world to demand that they pay prices for energy that will literally starve their people. And so we have to find a path forward. I'm confident that smart people with innovative technology, both in the United States and in Asia, can solve this. But in the meantime, and this is many, many years of meantime, we must produce this affordable energy to keep our countries, our health conditions, our sanitation systems, our ability to provide basic feedstocks for the world we're not going to do this with a, a transition that we say we're going to we're going to do this by 2026 or 2027. It, I simply haven't seen the technology that would permit that. And so there is much work to be done. Your idea of win-win back in 2015 when we began to, for the first time in decades, export American crude product around the world. Uh, it is important that we continue to do this. It, it matters to those of us, uh, especially to those of us in the West who care about the rule of law and human dignity. Well, Mr. Secretary, you just mentioned about rule of law, and then this is something which, in fact, uh, is often discussed about in the Korean society as, as well. 
with respect to one piece of legislation which passed the U.S. Congress quite recently. I think it was last August. And then that, uh, that uh, piece of legislation is called as Inflation Reduction Act about economic nationalism in the sense that when economy is as bad as today, then it is understandable. I mean, members of Congress, they are politicians. And politicians to be putting uh, at the very forefront the interests of their voters, that's quite understandable. But even then, I think there must, must be a red line. Red line would be rule of law. That's what I think. I wonder, I wonder what your view is. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, I, I'm in particular on this Inflation Reduction Act, uh, America needs to be very careful. My, my view has always been, since even when I represented the people of South Central Kansas, there's always the inclination to protect, right? There's always the inclination to protect an industry that's in your district or your state or your province. I, I get that. That's as true in the Republic of Korea as it is in the United States of America. My, my belief deeply was that the best, was, the best way to deal with this was through a set of agreed to understandings that were rigorously enforced, the rule of law, the very thing that you're speaking of, that were fair, that were balanced, that had as few barriers to trade as one could imagine, so no fewer subsidies on both sides, either place. Uh, this was the thing that would create the most prosperity. Uh, and as for this particular set of rules around electric vehicles, I actually think as written, it's unworkable. I don't think it will actually deliver the outcomes that were intended. And I think the Biden administration actually knows this and is working to try and fix it. Uh, there was enormous investment in the United States in some of these facilities from Korean companies. And it is incredibly important that we as a nation continue to encourage that investment. We want foreign direct investment here in the United States. In order to ensure that that continues, we have to make sure that we treat those investments in the way that is appropriate and proper and consistent with the very rule of law about which you speak. Right. Well, during your time as Secretary of State, may maybe as di Director of CIA, then United States, in fact, withdrew from something called TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. But other member countries of TPP, they just stayed on. So they agreed upon something called CPTPP, and the Comprehensive and Progressive TPP. So do you think it was the right decision for the United States to withdraw from TPP? You know, it's hard to go back and retrace where the international economy and where America sat at that point in time. I, I remember it was actually before uh, my time, if I remember correctly, uh, when the presidential campaign was on, uh, both parties walked away. Both the Republican Democrat Party walked away from the idea of TPP. Uh, I, I do not have as strong a bias. President Trump didn't like multilateral arrangements. Uh, for me, it's less important whether it is a bilateral arrangement or a multilateral arrangement. What is important to me is, it, is it an arrangement that creates a net positive benefit for the United States of America? And when, when done properly, these, uh, these trade understandings can actually do that. And then it was, it was done during the President Moon's visit to Washington DC, which happened in June uh, 2017. And I was still ambassador there. And then it was in fact quite embarrassing. The president was there. I mean, he was barely, I think less than two months old in his presidency. And then it was his first visit to Washington DC. And President Trump, he said, well, uh, our, our bilateral deal, uh, I think it is working uh, better for, for Korea and then not, not so for, for the United States. So we should be amending it. And then that in fact is what was done and it is being implemented. But at the same time, I think getting back to TPP a little bit, uh, are you, I think you're absolutely right when you say it was during 2016 presidential campaign that President Trump, he spoke very strongly against TPP. But at the same time, uh, Secretary Clinton, she also, she also spoke against TPP, which was surprising for me because uh, it was negotiated during her time as Secretary of State. Well, this year, then uh, President Biden, he proposed IPEF in the Pacific Economic Framework. And uh, I'm pretty sure you are very familiar with, uh, with uh, all those four pillars supporting this IPEF uh, pr proposal. And then the first proposal is on trade, but trade without preferential arrangement. So that, in fact, is the limit in the sense that where, where 
preferential arrangement is an anathema in the Washington context. But second, second pillar is interesting. In this instance, second pillar is about supply chain, how to strengthen the supply chain. And then the third pillar is clean energy, and fourth pillar is all the other ideas. So they, they, they I think, the four pillars of IPEF. And then Korea has already declared our willingness to participate in and benefit from IPEF uh, arrangements. So I think supply chain, I think, is a serious issue. So uh, the, the new Congress, I very much hope that if the new Congress comes up with concrete ideas, how to, well, in a sense, substantively strengthen the supply chain, especially among US allies, I think it will be much appreciated uh, by all the, all the allies in, in the Pacific. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I, this is something that we began in the Trump administration, uh, albeit uh, too late. So there's much work left to be done. But these supply chain issues, the, the elephant in the room in every one of these is the Chinese Communist Party. Many of these materials, these rare earth materials, uh, are controlled by China, whether they are inside of their country or they are in some country in Africa or South America. Uh, the Chinese have gotten their teeth into so many of these. We need to get these supply chains straightened out in a way between partnerships for freedom-loving, contract-protecting, property rights-believing nations that have respect for human rights. Our new Congress in Washington will take this on as a serious matter. I hope we will reach out to our partners in the Republic of Korea and our partners in Japan and actually work, and in India as well, to work on these supply chains in ways that we can all have confidence that this will work in a way that is beneficial for our own people. Well, Mr. Secretary, it was just, just such a pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to share this session with you. Then when they talk about the new leader, then, of course, one gentleman who surely comes up in my mind is, of course, you. So, so I very much, very much hope, I, I wish you the best, and then I very much hope that we will have uh, uh, other opportunities to, to meet, the, meet, meet with each other. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Bless you. Thank you for the kind words. I am counting on our relationship continuing and the relationship between our two countries continuing to be excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.